still see a significantly higher price for gold coming just as people move out of other assets into that. Um, when does it happen? This winter is going to be quite important for, um, for Europe in terms of their fuel and whether they have enough to keep warm. Um, and we'll have to see what the Fed does with interest rates, but the forecasts are they're going to be pushing over 4% uh, by early next year. Uh, I think they'll have to go a lot further and then they'll realize that they're slowing down the economy and they'll start printing again. Resources is targeting discoveries in a project portfolio of over 244,000 hectares, including epithermal gold in Argentina, high-grade copper in established mining districts in Chile, and a district-scale orogenic gold opportunity in Paraguay. Inside the markets here, production of stockpulse.com, and I've got with me now the man, the myth, and he's a legend here. He's a titan of mining. Rob McEwen here, of course, founder of Gold Corp. And uh, if you know the sector, you know who Rob is. And I've been a part of a, a lot of your uh, your chats here over the years, Rob. And uh, I guess uh, with uh, this uh, economical breakdown, I thought about you here to maybe give us a little uh, give us a little guidance here. So I guess I appreciate you, you taking the time here. And if we could start at the top here, how does Rob McEwen see the overall economy here, I guess, from a 36,000 foot level? Well, probably getting closer to the ground, I'd say uh, there's been a tsunami of monetary stimulation. Um, governments around the world in response to COVID, and I think also behind that, trying to move their economies forward, have been a massive amount of money printing. And the low interest rates have encouraged a lot of people to borrow, probably beyond what they normally would have borrowed if we had the historical interest rates out there, which are five or six percent over the last hundred years, um, I see the Federal Reserve uh, raising interest rates and the central banks around the world following suit, trying to ensure their currencies don't drop too far relative to the dollar. Um, so generally, rising interest rates. Um, and then I look to gold and I say, well, Wait a moment. Uh, the last time gold really ran and we had a lot of inflation, it took 18% interest rates to choke out the run in gold. Um, I think gold has right now is a very opportune time to be looking at it. It's discounted and people are forgetting about history. And so uh, I'd be a buyer of precious metals right now. Yeah, no shortage of of reasons to uh, to be in the in the in the metals, as you said here, Rob. Um, so I guess let's uh, record inflation here. Um, I know the the, the current administration uh, uh, gives themselves a, a pat on the back here when gas prices go down, but the reality of it is a lot of money was put into the system. Uh, how do you see this kind of shaking out over the next uh, I don't know months and even year? I mean, we are we in an inflationary environment, or I've even heard the argument we're going to be in a deflationary environment. How do you see it? Near term inflationary. Uh, I think the government's trying to stop it with interest rates, but that's just going to exaggerate the problem for a lot of people. Um, real estate, I think, has to come off. Um, a number of the other speculative areas, we've seen that uh, fever coming down, um, cooling off. But I do think we're going to see more inflation. There's just too much money floating around right now, um, bidding up demands. And then you have dislocations. Um, COVID was one that uh, threw the logistics system around the world out. Um, world trade seems to be slowing because of the conflicts that are now appearing around the world, the geopolitical conflicts. Um, it's, it's sort of a gloomy picture that way, but I, I see it people returning to some of the historical touchstones and stores of value um, as they see their um, the speculative investments coming off. Um, so where would I go? Well, personally, I'm in, I heavily invested in gold. 
I think you probably should be looking at uh, commodities, particularly food commodities, because uh, they're. Um, I was looking. I was in a supermarket the other day, and there was a tomato, a field tomato, selling for two dollars a pound. And I went, "Wait a moment, <laughs> this is that's too much for a tomato." <laughs> but that's just with a rise in uh, fuel costs and the disruption in the distribution systems. Um, there's a lot of shortages appearing, and the costs are coming through, whether it's for the farmer looking at what the cost of fertilizer is or the fuel for his tractor or the truck that carries his produce to the market. Um, those are all adding into the cost of living um, or the landlord that needs more rent because he borrowed at 0% interest rate. Now he has to get a lot more to cover as his interest costs. You you made a career out of uh, out of gold, I guess I'd say. Um, so you talked about it at the, at the top here. Yeah, let's 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 dive a little deeper down here. Um, obviously, a safe haven here. Um, if you're reading the tea leaves, I would imagine you're probably pretty perplexed uh, why the metals, certainly precious metals, are where they are. Maybe, maybe you could argue they're probably at okay level. Certainly, the junior mining sector would argue. But uh, but yeah, give us a little. I've I've been uh, I've I've seen a lot of your speeches over the years. We we throw numbers out there. You know, five thousand dollar gold, two hundred dollars silver. It all seems to make sense. The fundamentals are there. They keep kicking the can down the road, Rob. Where, where where does the rubber finally meet the road with the dollar? And when does gold and silver really have its day? That's an excellent question, Rob. <laughs> Been trying to answer it for a while. Um, I still see a significantly higher price for gold coming, just as people move out of other assets into that. Um, when does it happen? This winter is going to be quite important for um, for Europe in terms of their fuel and whether they have enough to keep warm. Um, and we'll have to see what the Fed does with interest rates, but the forecasts are they're gonna be pushing over 4% uh, by early next year. Um, I think they'll have to go a lot further and then they'll realize that they're slowing down the economy and they'll start printing again. I don't think they'll be able to main this course of higher rates without um, all sorts of political backlash let's uh let's shift gears into the the supply chain here um the the precious metals uh junior resource sector um certainly been uh, beat up here i've i've been in the game 13 14 years close to as bad as i've seen it as far as liquidity and maybe raising capital I'm sure you could probably uh point out a few other times here but it's not in good shape no matter what but the supply chain is very important so I guess give a little give a little guidance on how you see that sector. I mean, the the cliche is that we've never seen things uh, they're, they're they're cheap out there to buy. Um, not all those stories can win, but I guess kind of kind of give us a, give us a little uh, a little guidance on that. I remember back to the financial crisis, and the sector just got decimated. Um, and you looked at it and said, "Well, I should do some tax loss selling." Um, I've got some gains, I'll offset those and reduce my taxes. And I remember trying that strategy and thinking a couple of months later, that wasn't a good move. What I should have been doing was averaging down because the type of bounce that you see in these resource stocks, uh, when gold just pokes its head up and starts running, uh, the leverage is very large. Um, I guess you you buy when there's blood in the streets has been the the advice from centuries ago, um, and I think it's still true today. It might be hard for a lot of people to say, "Well, I have to adding to my position where I'm down," um, but they they do come back, and when they come back, they come back very quickly. And I I think we we went through the summer, and the summer is usually a cyclical low for gold. Um, I would have expected some bit of a rally in uh, September um, and then a little bit of a pop. And then you wait for January where people are repositioning their portfolios and you have a cyclical high in the first part of most years for the precious metal space. So now's the time to be just picking out your companies and I think adding to them. Yeah, let's uh, let's let's get into to your opportunity here. Um, McEwen Mining uh, MUX and the Toronto, or excuse me, the New York Stock Exchange and the Toronto 
uh, stock exchange and uh you're a busy guy you've uh you got uh you're you're in three places uh producing here you've got a little deal here you've uh, put together on elder creek here go with rio tinto um on a jv so i guess yeah get to get into daily activities and how things are going for mux well McEwen mining we've um been plagued with operating challenges for the last couple of years and the direction of our stock has been in the opposite direction to where i would have liked to have seen it going um we have a, I think, a rich portfolio of assets, um, and but the operating problems have obscured the value behind McEwen Mining. Um, our largest asset um, is not a precious metal; it's a copper project, and I'd I'd like to share with you. Uh, one, the rationale why we created this copper subsidiary that we're going to take public next year. Uh, we transferred our two copper projects into it. The largest of the two is a, the Los Azules copper project in Argentina. Um, and then another property in Nevada, which you just spoke about, the Elder Creek. Um, so I thought the... The market prefers a pure play, a pure precious metal play, or a pure copper play. So we've created this copper company, and I think it's um, it it could be a copper unicorn and really turbocharge the value of McEwen Mining. So right now, McEwen Copper is a privately held company, sixty eight percent owned by McEwen Mining. Uh, Rio Tinto came in for twenty five million at the end of August. Um, so they're the second largest mining company in the world. We were looking to test some of their technology to see if we can increase the recoveries and and the speed of recovery of copper from a heap leach. Um, and then a, a week later, Rio Tinto, we signed a deal with them to spend 18 million to earn 60% in a copper gold property in Nevada, in the Battle Mountain Cortez trend. But I'd like to show you a slide and just uh, talking about Los Azulas, this is the ownership slide. Um, I purchased last year, I put $40 million in personally into uh, McEwen Copper and own a 15% interest. Uh, and then Rio Tinto's in for 10, a group out of Australia for four and individual investors for another three. And we did McEwen Copper outside of McEwen Mining because we didn't want to um, have to issue more shares in McEwen Mining at these low prices. Right? We didn't want to dilute. So in the next slide, there are, Los Azules is in the same province of Argentina, San Juan province, as two other copper projects that are um, they've been in the news this year, um, and that is. The Jose Maria property that was purchased in April of this year for $485 million, and the uh, Filo Mining's Filo del Sol property that is um, currently trading for $1.5 billion. Now, just contrasting Los Azulas to those two properties, we're at a lower altitude, uh, 3,100 to 3,600 meters. Um, Whereas they're at 4,000 to uh, 4,900 meters and 4,900 meters to 5,400 meters. 5,400 meters is the base camp of Everest, same elevation. So when you go, the higher you go in the mountains, I'm sure many of your listeners have, and viewers have been in a high mountain situation. You, it's a little harder to breathe. Your exertion is difficult. Um, Machinery has the same problem, it doesn't work as, a, as well. And in Argentina, as you go higher, you get into a range where the snows stay longer and there are glaciers that you have to consider. And in Argentina, you have to avoid. So we're lower altitude. Our resource base is uh, significantly larger than either of those two properties right now. Our copper grade is higher. Um, we're closer to infrastructure than those two. Uh, Goldman Sachs did a, a report a few years back where they plotted 
the costs of all of the undeveloped copper deposits in the world. And Los Azules, were, they had in the lowest cost quartile, and Jose Maria was in the highest cost quartile. I do have to say that we're at a different stage of development. They've moved their economics forward more. Uh, Philo is at a pre-feasibility stage, and Jose Maria is at a feasibility stage, whereas we're at a preliminary economic assessment stage, and we're updating that um, shortly. So on the next slide, I just want to break down the sum of the parts of McEwen Mining. So I've developed a range, a low to high value for each of our assets. Um, Los Azulis, as I said, uh, Jose Maria sold for 485 million, public company purchased at a premium. So I said, well, let's discount that by 50% and multiply it by our 68% interest and divide it by our fully diluted shares of 51 million. And you get a value of $3.24 a share just for Los Azulis in McEwen Mining. Elder Creek, Rio came in for um, a 60% interest um, by committing $18 million. And so if you gross that up, what 100%, that'd be 30 million, and that would translate into a 51, 59 cent value per share. We have a portfolio of five royalties. Uh, there's a royalty on Los Azulas, on Elder Creek, on uh, the Cerro Negro property, around the Cerro Negro property of Newmont's down in Argentina and two other uh, properties. We have Nev Gold option from us in Nevada. And then you look, and that's 69 cents. And then you look at our gold and silver portfolio. We're guiding 150,000 ounces annual production this year. Uh, we're trading when we compared to five smaller gold and silver producers um, compared to their enterprise value divided by their gold equivalent ounces, um, they're trading at a 40% premium to us. So grossing that up, that would put a five over a $5 share, um, our value per share of McEwen Mining. And we discounted that to $2 in the low end and $4 in the high end. Um, going to the high end, Los Azulas, if you took, since we're larger, higher grade, lower altitude, closer to infrastructure than Philo. We took the Philo market cap of 1.5, multiplied it by our 68% interest and divided by the 51 million shares and you get $20. The other value is fairly constant except for the gold and silver of um, saying it was $4 rather than five. So you get a range there of over six, to over $25 a share of value. So I think we're undervalued, <laughs> trading at uh, a little over $3 today. What's gonna fix this sector, Rob? I think relative value that people start comparing um, what's been performing, what's holding value. Uh, that'll take a couple of months for people to appreciate that. Um, but I. I they're not making a lot of gold. Um, it's taking longer to get it out of the ground, permitting. Just uh, maybe it's too well-worn an expression, but history does come back. And uh, gold has performed very well during times of uh, distress. I'll, I'll give an example. Uh, maybe it's more current. Um, in 2007, in June, the end of June 2007, Apple introduced the iPhone. And uh, the top model had eight gigabytes memory and it sold for $599. At that point, gold was $650 an ounce. And recently, last week I was doing the calculation, the iPhone 14, I think is coming out at $1,099. And gold is uh, 1640. Um, so basically, you could buy an iPhone and a, and a half, the newest one, for an ounce of gold. Um, 
and you start measuring it, it it's looking at it so well what it's all about purchasing power how do you protect your savings how do you protect your wealth from the depreciation in value and i just look at it the dollar right now is being chased because it has the highest yield and it's a reserve currency in the world but it's being challenged by a couple of other countries that have been buying gold during this period and trying to position themselves Maybe not to take the title away, but to be an alternative to uh, that of the dollar. Yeah, all, all kinds of uh, ways to, I guess, uh, to play this. Uh, and that was a great analogy there. And I never thought of it like that. But yeah, gold is holding its own. I think uh, I think the problem might lie a little bit in the sector, of course. Uh, it's it's a, it's a hard game. Uh, you, you know it better than anyone. It's a, it's, it's a game you almost can't win. One out of a thousand almost to really pull it off. But it's important. Uh, the iPhone you mentioned... Uh, if if you miners aren't going into the ground getting these minerals, that iPhone doesn't even exist. So let's take a minute here and talk about just how important um, the junior mining sector is and the extraction of these resources that are dire to our infrastructure needs. So uh, um, it's, it's got to, it's got, as you say, I think uh, um, it's got to, at some point, history will fix it. But right now, a lot of damage is being created here. And uh, and I don't know if I see any true light at, at the end of the tunnel here. So I guess give us a little hope here in this in this mining sector. I believe a lot of the world thought that they you could just turn on a switch and we could go from fossil fuels to renewable sources of energy. And we're finding there's a there's a dawning of realization that that doesn't happen right away and it it doesn't happen for free um you could look at the example of germany inviting in the russians with their pipeline for gas and they said well we don't have to depend on anything else we've got our windmills and we shut down our our nuclear reactors we shut down our coal plants and we're going to make the world better and they were. I mean, the intent was great, but all of a sudden someone at the other end says, well, <laughs> we've got a tap and we're turning it off. And you go, oh, now what do we do? Uh, and there's a great scramble to buy fossil fuels. And you're seeing them starting up their coal plants and um, trying to source uh, oil and gas from all around the world right now. Um, I think we're all of the mind, we've got to clean up the atmosphere. But no one, very few have looked at the cost of doing that. And what is the impact on our lives in terms of cost of living? Well, I can tell you uh, to jump in there, Rob, if they if they want to get us to a zero carbon footprint, the, the end of the world is pretty much near. Uh, we don't survive without carbon dioxide. So it makes little sense really, honestly, what they're pushing. It's a very expensive process. We're on that track, but don't expect it to happen tomorrow. And it is, as you said, um, there's a lot of our modern society is built on the metals that we take out of the ground and get manufactured into products we all use. And also, we've been in a period of very inexpensive energy. That's um there's just a lot of power in a gallon of gas that doesn't, and it's reliable as opposed to intermittent like the wind or uh, sun goes down at a certain point of the day. So how will this all play out? Will we'll, uh, we'll, uh, um, the voice of reason finally come uh, uh, come to, to, to the top here and, and we'll re realize exactly what you're saying that's just really not sustainable. It's a great idea in theory. But there's not enough minerals on this earth to get everyone into electric cars. So it can't possibly work. But as you mentioned, coal plants coming online. Is is the cat kind of out of the bag now? Starting to. Starting to be. Um, it, it's don't think enough people have focused on the economics. The, um, you look at all the car companies have come out and said, we're going to be fully electric by 30 or 30, 2035. And you go... Well, where are you going to get the copper? There's not enough copper to be recycled in the world. Um, mines are taking longer and longer to permit. Um, 
and their capital costs are going up. Um, it, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's all good and in, good intentions. We, we just have to get others thinking about what we have to do to arrive at that point. Um, and it, it needs to be a balance between the natural ecosystem and the business ecosystem. Um, and once we start realizing that, then I think the world can move forward a lot faster. Yeah, I agree. Well, let, let's wrap up here, Rob. I really appreciate uh, your thoughts here as an industry leader. So I guess, uh, um, yeah, you've done it before with Gold Corp. Those who followed you in there probably have a much bigger house than they started with and uh, and, a, and a better life. Um, you're, you're trying to do it again here with, with Mux, your little different opportunity. Of course, you laid out a, a pretty good scenario. But I think we, in this interview, we laid out the importance to having exposure to metals and, and strategic metals like copper. So I guess give uh, give investors one uh, one last shout out here on uh, why they ought to take a look at uh, McEwen Mining. All right. Well, I'll start with my financial commitment. It's uh, 220 million. Uh, so, um, and our market cap is less than that right now. So <laughs> that's not where I want to be. Um, of that, I, uh, my equity investment cost in McEwen Mining is 140. I advanced the company 40 million at debt and I put $40 million into McEwen Copper. So um, I'm there believing in the future. Um, we have, uh, our exploration's been successful in extending um, the, the lives of our mines in Timmins. I think it'll happen in Nevada. There's a large copper project in Mexico. Uh, we have a feasibility study there that shows growth as well and dropping the costs and we had these challenges and I think most of them are behind us and we're on the upswing now and we're selling at a discount to the our peers uh, and we have this giant copper project that if I put it on a gold equivalent if you converted the copper to a gold equivalent using current prices it would be equivalent to a 60 million ounce gold deposit with uh, over 800,000 ounces of production a year at uh, under $600 cost. Well, that's a that, that's a nice picture. So um, yeah, in, in a sector of where uh, it's it's very romantic, where people are looking for the big score, uh, you do seem like you have quite the uh, quite the entry point. So I guess Rob, leave, leave us with uh, leave us with. Uh, are we going to have a rosy 23, or is it going to be a tough one? I like roses. I, th I think we're going to have a better year ahead. Better year ahead. That's okay. where I'm putting my money. His money's on a better year. All right. Rob McEwen, really appreciate you taking the time here. He's the uh, operator here of McEwen Mine. And of course, the name's right there, MUX on the New York Stock Exchange and MUX also on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And uh, Rob, again, appreciate the insights and uh, hope you're right. I'd like to see a rosy 23. So uh, thanks for the time. Thank you, Rob. All the best.